Good morning, everyone. Sound like you have your singing voice on today. Praise the Lord. I know our Easter Sunday celebration is two weeks away, but uh, it's good having one every Sunday. It's good to sing about him, isn't it? The Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to fill your lungs and your your person with sounds that don't talk about you, don't talk about us, but talk about the one who gave his life, our Redeemer. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Make Hope Known is the uh, theme and tagline of our series in the Gospel of Luke. And so here we are. We finished up chapter 9, and we're in chapter number 10. And uh, uh, a number of verses to cover, but we're going to cover them in a way where I, uh, today, uh, just using a short list of, of uh, just lesson supportive points and where God is leading us, but uh, I don't know. Just a good time of singing and praising the Lord. We continue in worship in His Word and love His Word so very much and love to be able to sing about the Lord Jesus Christ. As I mentioned, it is two weeks out before we have our Easter Sunday and we'll have uh, some uh, just sweet music from our praise and worship, uh, our choir and uh, some narration and of course, talk about the greatest day that came to the history of mankind and the greatest day in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ when he raised from the dead. We celebrate that day and look forward to that even in the setting here in Luke chapter number 10, late in chapter number 9 as we we're finishing into 10. We know that Jesus Christ has announced to his disciples, I'm going to go now. Uh, of course, Peter didn't like that very much, but uh, he's headed to Jerusalem. And so we are really in the last part of Jesus's ministry time on the earth as we go into Luke 10, 11, 12, on into 13, before it sets up for the last few hours, a few days of his life. So we're headed into a neat section of scripture. Now, of course, Luke, in his way, old Dr. Luke, he has quite an approach to things, as we know. And... Uh, Luke, of course, is a, uh, a doctor that uh, came to know Christ. We find him in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, somewhere in that journey time, and you can nail it down. That's a whole other historical study a bit, but you also know that as he wrote the Gospel of Luke, he also wrote the Acts of the Apostles. And so if you add up the chapters of Scripture that he wrote, he actually is credited with reading, writing even more chapters of the Bible than Paul the Apostle, which is kind of neat. But between the two, of course, we have qu quite, a, quite a bunch of stuff here. Of course, John wrote as much, of course, in the Gospel of John, his letters, so in the Revelation, the book of Revelation. So there's so much here. But I, I really love Dr. Luke's Gospel. It's given us a great insight into life and for how we're supposed to be. Remember, chapter 9 really brought us a lot of challenges. So let's do a three-minute fly over a real quick a little pass by verse number one of chapter number nine you're reminded as we have looked at it jesus christ taking in that moment in time and calling his 12 disciples together he gave them power and authority over all devils to cure diseases and sent them to preach the kingdom of god and to heal the sick we know that was the assignment for the 12 we know that if you even went back a little further just a quick reminder in chapter number 6 of Luke's Gospel, in verse number 12, we're reminded that Jesus Christ got into some, some kingdom training here when he, of course, he's training these disciples and training them deeply, and he pushed them, and he pushed them. And, of course, chapter 9 is an accounting of a lot of pushing and challenging by Jesus to his disciples. But he said in verse number 12, the scripture says in verse 12, when it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray, Jesus often did, continued on night in prayer to God. And what happened in verse 13? These 12 disciples that are closest to him, he's prayed over, he names them. He calls them and chose them to be his apostles. And there's that list. So you get an encapsulation of the 12 and how their assignment. Go back to Luke chapter number 10. Let me just read this one verse, verse number one, to give you context where we are today. After having this 
incredible time of just the 12 and Jesus working with the 12, but there's others following and there's other disciples. And they were around here and there. And we have in John's account of some disciples that just stopped following Jesus, you know. <laughs> they picked up their backpack and said, no more. And so we see in verse number 1 of chapter 10, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So here we have in the text a setup of Jesus Christ saying, hey, we have 12, we have some other people that are going out, but now this assignment that he has for those that are closest to him is now going to go to another level of people that are close to him, not as close, but they're disciples. They're not the same 12, of course, there's 70 others. You see, Jesus has been challenging these disciples, challenging those in the audience. The multitudes come to know me, believe in me. The kingdom of God is nigh unto you. I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. Luke's gospel is profound and powerful in so many ways. It goes then back to us as we look at some spiritual application for ourselves and what God would have us in the spirit as believers today, though we know historically that it's written there by Dr. Luke, and we got lots of doctrine that comes out of here. But for us, well, let me just say this. Effort, drive, passion, sacrifice, commitment, stick Intuitiveness. I looked it up and I put all the little dots where they're supposed to be. And then when I couldn't type it right, I copied and pasted and then it came out right. These words describe the servant of God who will give his or her all to the gospel mission. Wouldn't you agree? And there's so many other words you could think, those character qualities. Those that will give their everything, their all, because they believe in what Jesus Christ said. In Luke chapter number 9, verse number 23, it wasn't a suggestion. It is a way of life when you come to believe in Jesus. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. I'm going to give all the effort I can. I'm going to put all my drive of life, passion, to mean suffering. I will I, sacrifice. We talked about how lip service met sacrifice last week. And when it meets it, there's a real time for decision. Will I continue to give God lip service and my actions won't line up with my words? Or will I say I'm willing to sacrifice and lay myself down for Jesus and it's not just idle words? That's kind of where we've been in chapter number 9 going into 10. You see, Jesus pushed the disciples who became his apostles, all of them. And Jesus knew that those 12 whom he set apart as apostles, they just weren't enough. They weren't enough to reach the world. The world was a lot smaller back then. But let's just take the context of that present time. Just think about it. Say, well, let me just put it into me. Just, just stop that for a minute and just sit right here to reach that whole world. They didn't have any text messaging, SMS. They did not have any computers. They didn't have any cell phones. They didn't have any cars. They had to reach their world. Just like you and I have to reach our world with all the gadgets that we have to do it. Well, I wish I lived back then. Do you? When God said, I've ordained for you to live here now. And you've come to know me as Savior. And as the Lord of your life, I would truly not just suggest, but command that you deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Just as I pushed those disciples. Remember in chapter number 9, besides what I read in those first couple verses, it said in verse number 3 and 4 and 5, you know, take nothing for your journey uh, whatsoever how she go into there abide whosoever not receive you there's familiar verbiage there to what we're going to see that he has this verbiage to the 70 you see only the gospel of luke contains this account of jesus's jesus christ's discipleship training with an increase of troops he's increasing the troops sending out 70 others for the work you and i know that have asked jesus christ to save us called in the name of the lord to save us realize that I cannot save myself. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. I can't earn my way to heaven. I've got to realize that, hey, these things that these disciples are doing is as a result of them loving the Lord. Love the Lord. 
But they lost track of their love, just like we lose track of our Lord. You see, these sending, sending out these 70 others for this work had to reveal something about them. Many things, that list about effort and drive. To me, they have to be devoted to Christ. We are supposed to be devoted to Christ. This gospel has so much in it about how, again, Jesus wants his disciples to really live their life, to fall in love with him. And then I go back and I read Matthew and I go, oh, and Mark, yeah, and John, yeah. I'm going throughout the word of God and throughout the gospels, the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news that he saves souls by his grace through faith, not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. You call on the name of the Lord to save you. And that's what Jesus Christ is telling these disciples that I'm setting things up for because I'm standing before you and I am the kingdom of God fulfilled. Rate be for you. And when you go out on my name, you are going out as my ambassador, as the kingdom of God messenger. You are telling them about the one who's fulfilled it. You say, wait a minute, he hasn't gone to the cross. It's coming soon. To a theater near you. The followers who had excuse not to be fo fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, they were just passed by. Look at it real quick at the end of chapter number 9, verse 57. Came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man. So here's one man says, Lord, I I'll follow you wherever you go. And he said, Well, foxes, holes, birds, and air nests. Of the air have nests, but the Son of Man. Hey, listen, guess what? If you follow me, you're not even going to have a place to live. If you follow me, you're not going to have anything to eat. You're not going to have a whole lot of friends. You're not going to have anything in this world, in this life. What do you think? Do you go for it? He says, no. Hasta la vista. I'm gone. Verse number 60. Excuse me. Verse number 59. Another comes and says, follow me. But he said to the Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Whoa. There's a condition. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury the dead. Another excuse. But go thou and preach the gospel of God. If you have a family member to care for, that's wonderful. But if you want to follow me, that family member is very, 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 very important. But not more important to me. Not more important to me. So get somebody else in the family to take care of your family member. If you want to follow me. Because it'll be okay. And then, of course, that last excuse. This is a person that started following but he says, let me first bid farewell. I, I'm following you. I, I got to go. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got some other things I have to do. And Jesus is saying, you can't be divided and split when it comes to following me. You can't. You have to put your hand to the plow and stay with it. Guess what? It says in verse number one of chapter 10, as we already read, after those things, after these things, I put it in the past tense on the slide, tells us he moved on with a familiar assignment to go. He moved past them. Would you want the Lord Jesus Christ to pass you by? You see, it's not his fault. We want to blame Jesus for everything sometimes. You see, I, I look in the scriptures and I say that Jesus gave all and he asks for all in return. He knows you're going to fail and mess up. He says, I'm going to leave you my word and I'm going to leave you my spirit. And, and you're going to be buried in the likeness of Christ's death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. You're going to be quickened and made alive. But you, Mark Brown, are going to die. And I, Jesus, am going to come alive in you. That's a pretty good deal. That ought to be, oh! Amen. It's like the best deal ever. You gave up you. I gave up me. Worth very little. And I get everything. But it is for by grace are you saved through faith. There is no glory to God in any effort that is filled with excuses to God. Just stare at that for a minute. God doesn't get any glory when I have excuses. 
but I'll have excuses, and so I've taken glory away from God. So that's the deal. It's always a result that comes from my actions. Simple. God, I'd love to follow you, but I have. I can't. And he'll say, okay, that, that, uh, I'll let that go, and I'll forgive you, and I'll give you grace, and uh, I won't hold it against you, but if you continue to do that, you're going to miss out on the life that I had for you. You see, there's not, there's not realization of God's glory at work without guts to serve. You and I won't really grab a hold of God's glory unless we say, I will serve without condition there's no conditions of your love so i'll have no conditions when i come to you i'm here and i'm willing you know i'll have to take care of some things right lord i have children a wife some things are going to go bad you know but god's looking for your heart he's looking for your life and he will give you so much more in return. But sometimes I look inside, I got no guts at all. I'm such a sissy. And today I realized as I look through this passage, and I've been looking through chapter 9, I am nothing, nothing at all of what I thought I was. And I'm only something in Jesus Christ. When you think you've got God, sir, you think you can give God glory. There may be many times where you don't have guts and God doesn't get glory. So today I just want to begin to just show you a few things about no guts, no glory. See, it's a simple phrase. God simply means courage. It's courage. And you know the old phrase, it's somebody who's full of fear in the midst of the most scared moment of their life that decides to take a step of faith to do something. That's the person with guts. Because all of us get scared at different things. We're going to read the text. And like I said, I just have a simple list, simple list. Five of them, they won't take long. This passage, will, again, we're going to cover a few verses, but it breaks down beautifully, and it shows us that when I don't go about things with guts in grace, because it's in grace that I have the guts, then God doesn't receive the glory. Verse number 1, chapter 10. Let's read through the passage and then kind of circle back through it a little bit. Break it down. After these things, the Lord appointed others also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Think about it. If it's every place and every city, don't forget he's on his way to Jerusalem, but he's sending them out. This, there's a lot of places in Galilee, Judea. He's, he's, this is... He's, he needs 70. <laughs> Besides the 12, he needs a lot of helpers. Verse number 2, which ties together to a familiar passage in Matthew's gospel about the harvest. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Consider this. A lamb has to be pretty courageous. To go among wolves. But who cares for the lambs and the sheep? Jesus Christ will care for you. You need a shepherd that lives in Jesus to care for you as a lamb. We need more shepherds like that. We do. Not hirelings. We need shepherds to care for the lambs. Because the lambs are going out among the wolves. Carry neither purse nor script nor shoes. Salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. Verse 7, In the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. 
Go not from house to house, and into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you. Eat such things as are set before you. You know where your mom got that phrase? You better eat what's in front of you. Stole it from Jesus. Say, there you go. You thought your mom was so smart. Real quick, consider this. Jesus Christ is already breaking down barriers when it comes to where they're going. These are Jews. And they're being told wherever they go, whatever's put in front of you, you think they're going into a Jewish house every time? The kingdom of God is nigh unto you. Jesus Christ is sending them amongst the wolves. Gentiles, Jews. It's a pretty powerful statement there. It's a pretty powerful statement instruction by Jesus Christ. He says in verse number 9, And heal the sick that are there, and say unto them, The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Verse 10. But into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your ways out into the city, streets of the same, and say, Bring down hellfire from heaven. No, 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 no. That was John and James last week. You know, they, they got a little bit carried away. He says, Shake off the dust, but don't yet... He says, I'll take care of the destruction. Watch this. Watch how it unfolds. Even the very dust of your city, which cleaveth on us, we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. The fulfillment in Jesus Christ, the message of Christ is coming to you. And you're going to reject it? Well, the Old Testament, boy, there's a lot of rejecting going on there. So watch this incredible phraseology. It's so important here. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Didn't Sodom get destroyed? Wow. More tolerable for you, excuse me, for them in that day. Verse 13, woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if, thy, if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. He's very simply saying that in the Old Testament, if I showed up, like I'm showing up here, and I'm going to the cross soon, you are getting even a clearer message of God's incredible grace. And yet, they rejected. See, Jesus is telling these 70 going out, when you go into these cities and they receive you not, there might be some rough stuff that may happen from glory into them. Verse 15, And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. Didn't Jesus have a spot over there in Capernaum where he was doing incredible ministry? What a judgment. Remember, these places, real quick, are just on the Sea of Galilee, and like the northern side of the Sea of Galilee, like triangle of three of these cities of Bethsaida and Chorazin <clears throat> and Capernaum. It says in verse 16, He that heareth you heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me, and he that despiseth me despiseth him that sent me. Wow. So the hatred that they have for you is actually hatred for me and hatred for my father. Verse 17, down through 24 to finish out our text for today. And the 70 return again with joy. This is pretty neat. Saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Very important phraseology. And he said unto them, I believe Satan as, excuse me, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give you unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be by any means hurt you. Now remember this. Jesus is saying it to his disciples of the time that are going out. You say, well, would that apply to me today? Well, I wouldn't suggest that you go bit, get bitten by a, a mamba and, and test this out, okay? You might come out of it, you might not. Well, I thought if I was in the name of Jesus that I could be bitten by a boa or, a or whatever, a cobra. You see, the application clearly is the name of Jesus, the power of Jesus, him sending him out for a specific calling, and they 
are the sign and wonders of glory in the name of Jesus to heal people, to bring the kingdom of God to these people. It says in verse 20, Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Don't be so pumped up that you can do all kinds of stuff in my name. (laughs) Rejoice that in me, your name's in heaven. That's a good thing to rejoice in. Eternity is probably a little bit better to rejoice in than to be able to take care of a few little scorpion bites. So that wouldn't be bad. Verse number 21 through 24. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced his spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Sweet divine divinity deity verses right there. Jesus in his prayer to his Father. And he turned him into his disciples. He turned unto them privately, like he did many times. Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them. See, they're not around. But they talked of Jesus. They talked of the coming Messiah. They talked of God's greatness and goodness. But they, what if they had a chance? Well, you be blessed that you have seen who I am and what I've done. To hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. He's telling them, you want to really, really do things the way that I want you to do them? Then you need to have guts. And you need to give me glory. You see, the guts come from grace. Because he's so gracious. You know what? The glory belongs to him. Go to John 15. I'll show you this real quick. And you grab this. Off of, I know the the girls had a much better teaching that I'm going to even say to you right now from last week in your conference. But I want you to consider this simple little interaction here. Verse number 17, John 15. Jesus is, of course, sitting down with the disciples in his last words and last visit with them. These things I command you, it says that you love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Okay. (laughs) In Jesus, the world's going to hate you. You talk about laying it down for guts. That's kind of our setup here as we just make our list here in a moment. Jesus to the disciples that he is having his last hours with is saying that. As he's saying it to the 70, of course the 12 are always hanging out around him. And this crowd of people that are following and disciples that want to follow him passionately. And of course, in the visit after Judas is gone to betray him, he's saying, you know what? If you really understand this love thing, then if you love me, they're going to hate you. And it said in verse number 20 in John 15, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. Back to Luke chapter number 10. As a setup here, just, just understand the text. A few months out before that text I just read. Jesus is very simply saying to those closest to him as he is saying to us you're going to have to have you're going to have to have some guts to learn of me to walk with me you're going to suffer some things and uh You might even be hated. Is it possible that one of the reasons why we don't have the guts today and the guts then, 2,000 years ago, is because we're fearful of how we'll be treated? 
when the God of the universe loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why would I not risk the thought of someone who might hate me to then turn into a place where that person would love me because they fall in love with Jesus Christ and they accept Jesus Christ as Savior. I wonder today if we are receiving too much glory of our lives, even though we, do, we really say it a lot around here, First Bible Baptist Church, we desire to give glory to God. We do. And I see a lot of that. I witness it, and I thank you, God, for you. But I want to today in that, just that title, No Guts, No Glory, if Jesus doing this right here with these 70 hits us pretty hard. Well, let's see from our simple little list. Here's our first one in the list. Appointed to difficulty. That means I have to have guts and give glory to God. What do you mean? No guts, no glory means that Jesus Christ warned there were few laborers for the execution of the gospel ministry. Let me just say this. I'm not going to go through that whole... I just Here's how it hits. You may be the only one, but that's okay. You're the only one witnessing to people. You're the only one that's going to show up for salt and light. Hey, we have a salt and light time after second service today. Going to get together in a coffee house and a bunch of people, whoever goes, are going to go out and just talk to people, invite them to Jesus Christ, invite them to church, maybe go down to uh, Ball and Independence or go to the uh, maybe the shopping areas around here just to get together. Now, what if two people show up or three? Well, I don't know. It'll take some guts. And it has to be for the glory of God because it's difficult. Appointed. Where do I get that from? Verse number one. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. That a word appointed or chosen has nothing to do with some type of, hey, you're now saved and born again. No, he appointed them for an assignment. The assignment is that you go out two by two before his face, every city, place whether he himself would come. So the Lord's saying, hey, go wherever I would go to tell people about me. And Jesus is warning them that there'll be few people because it says in verse number two, the laborers are few. Send forth more laborers. Who is going to go? And who is going for Jesus Christ? There should be more people doing that. Jesus said in John 17, hey, I pray for those that in my name are going to go. They're going to believe on me and they're going to go tell other people about it. Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for thy sakes, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Hey, I heard that also too as it goes into this verse and then I'll come right back. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. The ones that come become disciples after they tell them that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me. It says here, verse number 10, excuse me, verse number 1 and 2 in chapter number 10, these things the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whether he himself would come. Pastor, that's four times you've read that on purpose. Because it leads into verse number two saying, pray ye therefore for the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth. Maybe that's just simply it. Simple. Jesus said it in his red letters. I'm appointing these 70 for a difficult thing. But as you go, you need to pray for more. Because it's difficult when you're the only one. Or maybe you're the only 70. And Jesus himself prayed. Being appointed to do this is difficult. Well, the other side of it is in Jesus Christ, all of us have been commanded to go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. We're supposed to go, every single one of us. Second on the list, sent forth with details. 
Luke 10, 3 through 9. No guts, no glory means that Jesus Christ delivers strict guidelines to follow for his method of ministry. Here we go. He says to them exactly what to do. You are lambs going among the wolves. So this is what I tell you. Don't grab a backpack and put a bunch of junk in it because it'll weigh you down in your mind and in your soul and in your being. Why? Because you're going to be concerned about the things that are in your backpack and your supplies. So number two, off of number one, trust me completely for your supply of life. Whatsoever house you go, don't worry about where you go. Just go to every house, wherever I send you, look for that place of peace and that moment of peace and that son of peace. Peace be to this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. Hey, look for that. If that happens, then you have a place to work through and work out of. But it said in verse number three again, I send you forth. Sent forth with details. Means that, hey, in the no guts, no glory, that Jesus Christ delivered these guidelines for a reason. I find myself, as I get a tiny bit older, not much older, but a little bit older, that I don't like being told what to do. Since I was four years old. Okay, so maybe three. So as I see things in my children, I see it in my grandchildren, I'm going, I'm having like a big revelational time in my life. They sound like you. They look like you. It's your fault. I don't like the instructions. I want to do it myself. But when you sign up for Jesus Christ, he gives you the instructions with detail. When you go to Saul, I don't want to be submitted to it. Pastor Brian will be there. Pastor Josh will be there. Whomever else. Hey, what are our guidelines today? I would like you to do this. I would like you to do that. You don't have to take this. You don't have to take that. By the way, we're a little different because it's told that you need to bring f- money for food when we go out in the salt and light today. See, because we're not sure who we'll run into. And I got that. That's the guidelines. Here's where Jesus is landing for us. He's saying, I'm sending you forth with details. When you go out from me, I need you to do my will, which goes to another level, follower of Jesus Christ, disciple of Jesus Christ, someone who wants to really, really, really walk with Christ. It's not your rules. It's not your instruction manual. It's God's word, God's ways, God's truth, God's directions, God's instructions. And many believers will not do what Jesus Christ tells them to do because they don't like his instructions. But he's giving them to us for our benefit, for his glory, for his honor, because you were made for his pleasure, not for yours. And he saved your soul, and he gave you the greatest deal ever in the face of the earth. And it's not a deal, by the way. Because he gave his life. He shed his blood. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, and he raised on the third day. We celebrate that in a couple of weeks. We celebrate it every Sunday. Because when they ran to the grave, they said, he is not here. That's the greatest words ever spoken. He is not here. And so we look at that and go, do I need to put my faith and trust in that? If you have not put your faith and trust in the one who can save your soul, it ought to be time to do so. Break yourself down. I'm going to confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that God had raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Enough of you walking in you and trying to add him. How about if you walk away from you and let him completely make you new? Brand new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You think different. You walk different. You love things differently. It's a good deal. And we know it's not a deal. Because Jesus Christ is saying... I have appointed you to difficulty, disciples, and I'm also sending you forth with detailed instructions. And in verse 9, it's powerful when he says, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. That's what you're supposed to say to them. Tell them that. Don't tell them anything else. Tell them that. They'll ask a question. You say, who's the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? It's Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Third one on our list. We'll keep on moving. Receive not is destruction. This is a crazy one. We don't have to spend a whole lot of time on this, but just watch this one. Verse number 10 says, But into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, go your ways. Out into the streets of the same, and say, 
And they deal with that, deal with that. No guts, no glory means Jesus Christ proclaimed that they were, there were eternal consequences for rejection of the Savior. What do you mean? He's the one that can do the judging. But John's gospel says that he said he did not come to judge. Right. Because he didn't come to judge that aspect that they're angry at him about, which is their behavior, their sinful way, because they're already judged by their own sin. The Bible says, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. See, we're condemned in our own sin. We condemn ourselves. And if we never accept Jesus Christ as Savior, then this destruction stuff will come because we'll take our last breath and now our body will go in the grave and return, the spirit will return back and now the soul will be before God and Jesus Christ. Lord, Lord, I, I never knew you. I never knew you. That would be the worst three words to ever hear. What is Jesus Christ saying about Corazon, Bethsaida, Capernaum, you are rejecting the Savior of the world. And we, with the guts and the glory, need the guts and grace, the guts to say, hey, if you receive not Jesus as Savior, if you do not call on the name of the Lord to save you, if you don't understand that you cannot save yourself and that you do not repent here, then one day, when you take your last breath, you will meet the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Put your faith and trust in me and me alone. That's what Jesus is telling his disciples to do because there will be destruction. That is the part of when we do not have the guts to go out in his grace and we do not give God the glory for our message because it is his message. The tragedy will be that there will be so many more souls in hell. You say, well, God can save anybody. Absolutely. And it's not on me. Okay. But are you not called to be a seed sower? He'll make the harvest come. He'll work the harvest out. We're to be seed sowers. That's the laborers. The last two. They come together really nicely at the end here. Verse number 17 through 20. Rejoice in demonstration. The last one was pretty harsh. Those first three are about having no guts to let people know in grace and mercy. These last two are about we can really give him glory in these places. Look at the glory that the God of the universe receives. You see, no guts, nor glory means Jesus Christ commended the disciples for their victories in his name as a reward of their name being written down in heaven. That's a pretty good thing. Because they went out in his name, they declared his name, all kinds of neat things happened. Again, verse number 17 says, the 70 returned again with joy. That's cool. Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Yes. Glory, glory, glory. That's glory to God. We go down a little bit further in verse number 20. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you. Be careful how much you rejoice in that because this is what I want you to rejoice in. Rejoice that your name is written down in heaven. Ooh. You know that old hymn? There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white robe angels sing the story. A sinner has come home. Ooh. Short commercial. I know God doesn't need to write anything down like we are. So, I, you know, people say there's going to be these big books that are going to be opened up on top of Saturn. I don't know. But I do know one thing. When I hear that and I listen to that, God took the time 
to write me down. He knows the day when I meant everything I said, though I can't even remember what I said. And I walked away from that moment. Thank you, God. All the sin was gone. I was forgiven. You are forgiven. Remember? I like when Tessa would just say, hey, yeah, I messed around a little bit, but then at 22, I said, ah, I had enough. I had enough. I'm going to live for you, Jesus. And I want to tell people about that. Guts with grace will allow us to do it so that God will receive the glory. Because you can then come back and go, Woo! I talked to three people, four people. Didn't mean for you to jump. And I, and I, think, I think one of them really listened to me. Yes, it was really cool. And, and the other one listened to me. And the other one listened to me. And, and I think that person's thinking about coming to know Jesus as Savior. Last one on the list. Number five. We're at the end of this section. Verses 21 through 24. Blessed as disciples. How blessed are we? As disciples. When, when you go in that thing as a disciple. I mean, that's the blessed thing. See, no guts, no glory means Jesus Christ extolled all glory, belonged to his Father as his Son, stating they are one. If you want some incredible deity verses right there, those are good. You see, you think that these disciples and this confirmation of rejoicing, but don't rejoice in that. Just rejoice in the fact that your name is written in heaven. Woo! But they did have a chance to do some really cool things down here. But it's even greater in eternity. Well, verse number 21 tells me down to 24 that Jesus and the Father are one together. And the way that Jesus in this prayer is so beautiful. Oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. That thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Very simply, it's not, oh, the smart people will never come to Christ. It's the smart and wise of this world breaking down and saying, as a baby, I need you to save me. Brokenness can be good. If it leads you to a place of repenting of yourself and turning to the one who says right here, it takes you to become a baby. Become a baby. I need you, Father. I need you, Jesus. All things are known to me, my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he, and he to whom the Father will reveal. And then he tells them in verse 23, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. He's turning to the disciples and saying, hey, 70, 12 over there too. Hey, do you know what you have seen? You're seeing glory in front of you. Peter, James, and John, transfiguration. Do you guys have any idea what you just saw? I'll finish with this. John chapter number 10. I'll just read it and I'll be done. John chapter number 10 Verse number 25, Jesus answered them. Who's he talking to? He walked in the temple of Solomon's porch and he's talking to all these Jews that want to give him a hard time. What does he say? John 10, 25. Jesus answered and said, I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So <laughs> they're doing things in Jesus' name. He's doing things in his Father's name. Isn't this so cool? I guess they must be like one. Ah. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. You come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. This will be one of the most precious passages of Scripture that you'll ever, ever read. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. That's money right there. 
You could take that one and buy eternity with that because Jesus bought it for you and for me. It says up on the screen for our prayer time this. The time is urgent. The time was urgent 100 years ago. The time was urgent 100 years ago. The time was urgent right there. The time's urgent all the time. The time is urgent to minister the gospel with the guts of grace. Because in his grace, you're able to have guts to then do some faith things. And it'll all be for his glory. The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you and to me. What would life in Christ be like if we seek first the kingdom of God? Oh, let's keep on doing it. Do it a little bit more. Let's really seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Why don't you stand for a word of prayer? Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Let me pray for you. These questions here can be answered in the time of prayer up here in the altar in our invitation time. If you have questions about salvation and wonderments about that, I'll be up here and you can come and talk to me. After service, I'll be here if you don't want to feel like embarrassed. But I'll be up here to answer any questions you have about Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together in your word and worship and singing this morning, just thinking, oh, powerful music this morning prayer reading scripture and then getting into your word for a few minutes today thank you thank you thank you jesus you deserve all the honor and glory and power forever amen i pray for our invitation this time of prayer this time of conviction